it is uh, a great uh, pleasure and honor to be uh, here today uh, speaking with Professor Nick Bostrom. Um, Professor Bostrom is uh, one of uh, my favorite uh, people uh, alive today and probably um, in, in history. Uh, from my perspective, he's, from my perspective, he's um, you know, if we make it as a species uh, into the far future, uh, it'll be in significant part thanks to, thanks to him um, and his uh, work helping us look, think about the future, think about the long term, think about how we might evolve. Uh, he's written, of course, about um, many things in, in, uh, in technology, but especially about uh, digital minds, the evolution of uh, humanity, um, super intelligences, and more. Um, he uh, leads the Oxford um, uh, Future of Humanity Institute, uh, where he and many other um, researchers uh, help the world think about these extremely um, important topics in, in a variety of ways from both um, uh, research directly into the philosophy of um, these questions and the um, making estimations about uh, the real impact and also framing and constructing uh, important policy work uh, that can help guide um, many policymakers around the world in how to think about these critical critical uh, policies. So we're today we're going to have a, a uh, you know very uh, good and lively discussion about um, many of these topics, uh, especially things like superintelligences. Where are we in in these timelines? Um, uh, whole brain emulation, digital minds, uh, the future of these, the challenges for our civilization, uh, and more. Uh, the format of the evening will be that uh, we'll sit in a fireside chat first. Um, I'll ask a set of questions, and then um, around uh, 30 to 40, mi uh, maybe f maybe 50 minutes from now, uh, given I have a bunch of questions, uh, I'll open up to and transition to um, questions from the audience, uh, and then we'll, we'll um, set a set amount of time. Then uh, I will be reading from both questions that I've sourced from sourced from many folks around the Product Labs community. Um, ahead of time, and from audience members who are here uh, in person, and from the folks in the live stream uh, watching. Uh, so I'll be checking out um, Twitter for the hashtag PL Breakthroughs. So if you want to ask a, a question, either find the, um, the uh, tweet about it, and please uh, enter your question with the hashtag PL Breakthroughs. I'll be monitoring those. And then I'll try to round robin between um, source questions ahead, uh, person, people in the audience, and the live stream. And uh, if there's a uh, new uh, digital intelligence out there lurking on Twitter, please feel free to uh, join the discussion. <laughs> uh, well, welcome, Nick. Thank you so much for being with us, and thank you so much for your work. Uh, how are you doing today? Uh, so far, so good. Uh, great. So let's kind of uh, you know dive right into the deep end. So uh, thinking about super intelligence, um, based on kind of like latest developments, uh, how have your estimates of super intelligence development um, shifted over time, like um, kind of in hindsight, wh where we are now in 2022, looking back, um, how do you think things are going? Are things proceeding faster or slower than you might have thought? Uh, where do you think we are? I think since the book Superintelligence came out in 2014, uh, developments have been faster than expected. So timelines generally have contracted. Um, it's quite impressive to see the uh, rapid pace of advances in recent years and how the same set of basic techniques, uh, big deep neural networks and specifically transformer models just seem to keep working in many different domains. And even as you scale them up, you continue to get better results. And as the shifts, what have been some of like the most surprising results from this that you, you think, um, I don't know, maybe you, you just didn't expect this particular concrete thing to be possible so soon. Um, I think uh, AlphaGo uh, happened ahead of schedule. Well, I mean, I, I think just recently before it happened, it was kind of clear that it was going to happen. But I think um, it was quite impressive that you could take something that is a, a very deep pattern recognition problem with deep strategy where humans have worked for thousands of years to try to refine and come up with the best strategies that, that uh, you could just like solve it with AI. Um, and, uh, and then I think the uh, GPT-3, the large language models is, I guess, slightly, I mean, I don't think any of these is like uh, 
hugely surprising. And by now we kind of expect to be surprised. And so we are not really surprised, but, but still, yeah, I think, uh, these, these are impressive achievements. Um, and, and I guess even just before that, the, the, uh, the, the, the fact that image recognition and image processing was one of the first really cool things that started to work is maybe a little bit surprising ex ante, given that it's a large chunk of the human brain that is devoted to visual processing. It's not like some kind of simple logic chopping activity. And so, so the fact that that fell into place and that you can do this like quite sophisticated manipulation of imagery, uh, um, I think was, uh, was, uh, slightly surprising at, at the time. What do you think about developments like, um, AlphaFold and the just solving that set of challenges, do you think that that is substantially different or is it, um, it's not like a, a substantial leap, it's just kind of a very great application, but, um, or do you think that that's a, an important improvement? I mean, in terms of surprise, like, I guess once you can do AlphaGo, it's not so surprising that it should work for AlphaFold as well. Like humans have put in less brain power into figuring out how to fold uh, proteins than into playing Go. And it's at least superficially looks like the same kind of pat spatial pattern type of stuff. Um, obviously in terms of practical ramifications, AlphaFold is potentially uh, a lot more useful and, uh, for, for, for medicine and, uh, chemical research, uh, maybe like extensions of the same system. Um, I, I, I do think that as we move into some of these more applied areas that there are, um, potential security concerns that we need to also start to take more seriously. I mean, my, my work has been focused more on risks arising from human level or, or super intelligence, like general AGI, where they can reason and have a kind of transformative impact on the world. But there might also be some narrower domains where, uh, there will be smaller, but still significant issues. Um, uh, so what, one of those would be in synthetic biology, if it becomes too easy to concoct bad stuff. Uh, it, it might be, for example, that the, the, the scientific model of open publication and make all your, your, your models, uh, ideally available to anybody to do anything is not the right model for, for those application areas. Yep. And when you think about the current architectures and you know, certainly the large, the language models have been extraordinarily successful in a variety of domains, but, um, do you think that this is the architecture? that is likely to evolve into an AGI? Or do you think that there's some substantial architectural improvements that, that the humans have to make first? My guess would be that if there are substantial additional architectural improvements, there are not that many of them. Um, and maybe they would be built on top of transformer models or add connected up to the transformer models or some variation of transformer models. Um, so, so maybe like, I don't know, like my median guess would be maybe I don't know, maybe, it, maybe it's just something that like is as big an advance as transformers were. Like if we get one more of those, like that could easily be enough. I mean, it's also possible that just scaling up what we currently have with some minor things would suffice. Um, but if there is some other thing, like you need, um, uh, you know, to connect it up with some kind of e external memory uh, system, or you need some other inductive bias that make the representations more easily composable in certain, like so, so, some kind of extra thing like that, that may or may not be very hard to discover. Uh, that would not at all be surprising. Um, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you think that these models, um, could I mean, they're certainly being used to optimize themselves and so on and, and guide the design. And there's all kinds of structures in which models are being used to, um, you know, there's, there's layers and layers and layers of meta modeling. Um, do you think that these are kind of getting close to this kind of recursive self-improvement of being able to kind of very generally explore the, the constraint space to try and solve like larger scale problems? Like I'm imagining here some structure where you have a, um, 
uh, you know, some, some list of problems and you have some uh, model sampling between these and you start with the easy ones and you try to sort of train a populations of agents to be, or populations of intelligences to be able to solve these and then kind of over time just kind of scale up the, the system. Do you think that that kind of thing, it, it seems to me that um, it'd be like, nobody had, thankfully nobody has really tried this, but it doesn't seem like far away from something that could be possible. Um, yeah, I guess we're seeing limited versions of AI being applied to help AI research. I mean, we have like co-pilot and general kind of coding assistance uh, of, of course, you have various forms of hyperparameter optimization regimes. Uh, there have also been some applications in the design of hardware where the kind of circuit layout has been done. I, th I think for the um, TPU4, I think Google used um, AI assistant to kind of optimize the, the, the layout of the circuitry. Um, data centers, uh, cooling machinery that have been like, you, you can kind of shave off some percent by having that optimized by some RL system. And so I think we'll certainly see more incremental stuff like that. <clears throat> um, my, my guess is that one we when by, by the time we get like a really strong feedback loop where, where sort of the AI can do the core thing that researchers are doing, like the actual identifying the right research questions and approaches and like that, 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 that seems quite, uh, late in the, like when, when that happens, we are pretty close to the singularity or, or the takeoff or whatever the ramp or whatever, whatever the shape of that will be. Um, <clears throat> um, but, but certainly these more domain specific incremental, uh, ways of accelerating AI advances. I think we seeing some of already and can expect to see more of. Speaking about takeoff, do you sort of expect, or based on what you have seen so far, do you think we're more on, you, more on the slow, moderate, or fast takeoff? This is uh, sort of the three options that you um, you thought through. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I I still think that the slow looks less plausible, meaning decades, say between when you get something roughly human level until you get something that completely leaves us in the dust. That, that, that seemed less likely uh, back when I wrote the book and still seems less likely today. I guess um, we have a little bit more granularity now uh, in, in that we have these model systems that, that work and you can at least consider these scenarios where human level AI is achieved by scaling up current systems or variations of that. That gives us a little bit more of a concrete picture of at least one way in which these can develop. Um, and it's possible that you might then have something that is really very uh, dependent on compute and that really you get performance kind of proportional to the, the size of the model or the, the, and, and the length of the training and in, in a relatively smooth way. Um, so in some of those scenarios, you might have <clears throat> something that is less than ma like super rapid because what you will get is something that costs like a billion dollar to, you know, uh, train up one human level AI. And then, then you might immediately be able to run multiple of them because, uh, it, it, it takes a lot to train a model, a lot more to like train up a model than to to run it, so you might then be able to run like a hundred or a thousand of them, but that's still not enough to outcompete uh, on the order of ten billion humans, right? So, so depending on like if if you really stretch yourself very far to just barely be able to run a model as big as a human, uh, it it might then take a significant period of time before you can go many orders of magnitude above that to sort of get something. Like if, if you need to scale that up by a factor of a million, say to go from running like on the order of a thousand humans to a, a billion humans, that getting through six orders of magnitude, uh, when you're already like using a billion dollars and, and like a large chunk of your data centers, like that, that might just not be an instantaneous process. So, so, so there are some scenarios where this would happen more on a sort of intermediate time scale. Um, now. In, in some sense, I guess that's like the kind of the 
the, the baseline projection. Like if, if you just like extrapolate the way things currently work, um, I, I don't think we can uh, preclude the possibility of there being more rapid capability jumps. Like A, of course, if there is like some missing architectural invention that we haven't made that suddenly makes it click. But but you also have these phenomenon uh, phenomena like like grokking where where sometimes you have a kind of discrete um jump in some particular type of capability. Uh like maybe multi-step reasoning where if if each step has has less than x percent chance of being correct, then like you get an exponential uh, chance of reasoning correctly and you really can't do more than like three or four or five steps but maybe once you get it above a certain level and then maybe you can do some sort of self correction reasoning like analogous to like quantum computation protocols like that um, you, you could also imagine cases where like things come together and you suddenly get the specific types of things that make us humans have the extra oomph that we have relative to other animals like full ability to learn from language and to reason and plan of, on that. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, I wouldn't preclude these more rapid takeoff scenarios either yeah. at all. Like, yeah, um, certainly some of the latest developments and some scaling down some of the models and getting similar results uh, sort of point to there being um, just a lot of inefficiencies in the training process <clears throat> now. And once you sort of um, know what you're sort of looking for, you can kind of um, ablate away a lot of pieces. And so um, something like that yeah. could happen with a general learning <laughs> algorithm. Um, yeah, yeah. So certainly now you find like, yeah, so first you achieve state of the art and then like six months or 12 months later, you can achieve the same thing with maybe 10% of the computer or something. Now, well, I would expect a little bit of that to go away. As, as, as these systems become bigger and more expensive, you might imagine more of the easy uh, gains to be made earlier on. Like um, if, if, if you really have a lot of smart humans working really hard on building a system, you, you might have plucked more of the low hanging fruits than if it were like a two person uh, postdoc team that were working for a few weeks. Chances are that will be big, easy additional things you could do to improve that system already. But but if you're spending many billions of these, like you're gonna look quite hard if there are ways to sort of uh, speed up the training process. So you could like save a hundred million. And, and with, um, uh, are you hopeful that um, restrict restricting hardware development or, or use um, is a promising path? I mean, semiconductor manufacturing is extremely difficult, but um, more and more companies are sort of forced to do it because of, you know, kind of hitting the barriers with um, just the size of the of the systems, and then needing to do sp special applications and special purpose things, and many more companies are now developing their own um, chips and so on. So, are, are kind of like hardware restrictions viable here, or are we kind of, or is that a pathway um, that's just unlikely to work? Um, yeah. So a lot of people can like design their own chips, but only uh, a few actors can actually build them. So. Um, and and then there are some other choke points uh, further upstream in terms of making the equipment for the factories that build the chips where currently to make cutting edge chips, there's like ASML, which is like a single node. Um, is, is that, and, and, and indeed we do see like, I mean, with these recent moves by the US to restrict exports of uh, cutting edge chips to China and quite comprehensive also not to sell the equipment, also not to allow American persons to work for these companies. Um, I don't know what fraction of the motivation for this is like AI specifically versus more generally a sense of this being a high tech area that's going to be key to national competitiveness. Um, yeah, I don't think it's out of the question that the hard, I mean, it com compared to the alternative, which would be like to to like uh, restrict access to ideas and algorithms and stuff. That I mean, that that might work for a short period of time, but independent discovery means um, it's 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 like a, yeah, a, a, at most a short term stopgap measure. Whereas the hardware would like take a lot longer if you needed to build up like the whole supply chain on your own. Like that would be a multi decade. 
uh, project, right? Um, now that said, I'm not. I, th I think what I would favor would be for there to be the ability at the critical time to to go slow, to have a short pause, maybe to check systems and to avoid the most uh, cutthroat type of tech race to just launch as quickly as possible because you get scooped if you take even an extra week to like, I think that that would be bad now. Um, so, so having enough coordination or control to be able to go at the moderate pace when, when, when you sort of reach approach human level would be good. I, I, I don't, I wouldn't want to stop the development of, um, advanced machine intelligence, um, permanently or, or even like have a very long, uh, pause either. I think that brings its own negatives. Um, and, and I think some of these attempts to restrict the chip supply also have the side effect of creating a more adversarial dynamic. I think it would be, a uh, really nice if we could have a, a world where the leading powers were more on the same page or friendly or at least corporate had constructive cooperative relationship. I think a lot of uh, the uh, X risk pie in general and the risk from AI in particular uh, arises from the possibility of conflict of different kind. And so a world order that was more cooperative uh, would look, yeah, uh, uh, more promising for the future in many different ways. So I'm a little worried about, especially kind of more unilateral list move to to kind of kneecap the competitor and to be playing nasty. Like I feel that, uh, yeah, I'm uh, very uneasy about that. It, it sounds, well, so if the hardware, um, it, if ideas or hardware will only buy a certain amount of time, then really AI alignment is the best path forward. and very much agree that um, we don't want to restrict the, the creation of digital intelligence um, and that that's sort of the next evolutionary um, uh, jumps. And there's some questions there around kind of like which path should we take and how do we develop uh, brain computer interfaces <coughs> and whole brain emulation and, and so on. Um, but kind of like even before getting into that, um, how hopeful are you that we might solve the AI alignment problem? Um, moderately, I, I guess I'm quite agnostic, uh, uh, but I, I think the main uncertainty is, is how hard the problem turns out to be. And then there's a little extra uncertainty as to how the degree to which we get our act together and like, but, but I, th I think, I think like out of those two variables, like the, the, the realistic scenarios in which we either like you know, are, are lazy and uh, don't like focus on it versus the ones where we get a lot of smart people working on it. So there's some uncertainty there that affects the success chance. But I think that's dwarfed by our uncertainty about how, how intrinsically hard the problem is to solve. So um, you, you could say that like the most important component of our strategy should be to hope that the problem is not too hard. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so let's try to tackle it. So how do you, as you've thought about this problem, um, have you kind of uh, been able to break it down into components and parts or, uh, or maybe evolved your thinking of the, of the shape of the problem? Like, what are you thinking now? Um, well, I think the field as, as a whole has made significant advances and developed a lot since uh, when, when I was writing the book where it was like really a non-existent field, there were a few people on the internet here and there, but now, now it's an active research field with, uh, a growing number of smart people who are, have been working full time on this for a number of years and writing papers that build on previous papers with technical stuff and, and all the key AI labs have now, uh, uh, some contingent of people who are working on. Uh, alignment, DeepMind has, OpenAI has, Anthropic has. Um, so, so that's all good. Now, within this community, there is, uh, I guess, a distribution of levels of optimism, ranging from people very pessimistic, uh, like Elias Yudkovsky, uh, for example. And I, I guess there are people even more pessimistic than him, but but he's kind of at one end, and, and towards people with more uh, moderate levels of optimism, like Paul Cristiano, and then others who, who think it's kind of, um, 
is something that we'll deal with it when we get to it and uh, who, who don't seem too fussed about it. Um, I, I, I think there's a, yeah, a lot of uncertainty on, 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 on the, the hardness level. Now, as, as far as how you break it down, yeah, so there are different ways of doing this. Um, there's not yet one paradigm that, that all competent AI safety researchers share in terms of the best lens to look at this. So it decomposes in slightly different ways depending on like your, your angle of approach, but certainly one can identify different um, facets that one can work on. So for example, interpretability tools seem on many different approaches, like a useful ingredients to have, like basically insights or techniques that allow us better to see what is going on in a big neural network. Um, uh, you, you could have one approach where you try to get AI systems that um, try to learn to match uh, some human uh, example of behavior, either like one human or some corpus of humans, and then uh, tries to just perform a next action that's like the same as its best guess about what this reference human would do in the same situation. Um, and, uh, and and then, then you could try to do forms of amplification on that so that if you, if you could like uh, faithfully model one human, well then you just get like a human level A like intelligence, you might want to go beyond that. But if, if you could then create many of these models that each do what the human do, can you then put them together in some bureaucracy or do some other clever bootstrapping or self-criticism? Uh, so, 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 so that 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 would be one approach. Um, you could, um, yeah, you could you could uh, try to use sort of inverse reinforcement learning to infer like a human's preference function, and then try to optimize for that, or maybe not strictly optimize, but doing some kind of softer optimization. Um, um, yeah, there, there are a bunch of different ideas. Like so, some safety work is more like trying to more precisely understand and illustrate in toy examples how things could go wrong, because that's like often the first step to creating a solution is to really deeply understand what the problem is and, and then illustrate it. And yeah, that so that that that, that can be useful as well. Um it it it's interesting now that we have these models that can uh, uh, talk, as it were, or like use language that kind of opens up um, an, an additional interface, like an additional way of interacting with these systems and trying out different things. Um, and 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 a different way of illustrating the awkwardness, like the the the, the idea of prompt engineering when when you're trying to get an AI to to do something and you're trying to try to figure out exactly the right formulation like that that shows that we are not quite where we need to be in terms of directing the intrinsic capability of these large language models so it's in there and and yet we can't always even elicit it uh, because you have to find exactly the right wording and then suddenly it turns out this thing is actually perfectly capable of doing something which initially it seemed it failed at um, so, so getting better at that or coming up with something better than prompt engineering like would would be uh, good. I I'm I'm kind of <clears throat> um, uh, I I have some sympathy for an approach which I think has not been explored very much yet. But partly because it it's hard to explore it until the technology reaches a certain level of sophistication. Which is the idea that as you get <clears throat> systems that become closer to human level in in their conceptual ability and uh, that might then internally start to develop concepts that are uh, more similar to human concepts, <clears throat> in, including not just concepts about simple visual features and stuff, but more corresponding to our uh, higher language concepts, like like our concept of a preference or a goal or a request or being safe, being reckless, like these types of concepts. Like we humans seem relatively robustly to be able to master these concepts in the course of our normal development, um, despite us having starting with different brains and having different environmental input and noise. And so, so maybe there is a relatively robust and convergent ways in which some of these concepts could be grasped. Then the hope would be that you could kind of 
uh, train up an AI that doesn't need to be above human and maybe hardly even human that, that would then sort of internally form these concepts in the same way that we form them. And then once those concepts are in there, you might then be able to use those as building blocks to create a kind of alignment uh, by sort of linking motivation to these concepts. Uh, it, very hand wavy, but I think something in that direction is one interesting approach to the alignment problem as well. Do you think there's some promise in trying to evolve a notion of morality and ethics, meaning using simulations of environments where agents might um, learn to cooperate uh, and over time learn the, go, put them through the same kind of game theory dynamics that gave rise to our own notions of um, symbiosis <clears throat> and, and, and ethics and so on? Potentially, yeah. I mean, I, I think you would want to be looking very closely at exactly how you set things up and the dynamics that unfold. I mean, real revolution is, is sort of red in tooth and claw and can create wonderful cooperation, but also uh, uh, hostility and defection and manipulation and all kinds of things. Um, but yes, certainly multi-agent systems uh, with the right kind of incentive structures in place so that you evolve. Like evolution itself can produce many different kinds of outcomes, de like de depending on the environment. Um, but that certainly could become, in some scenarios, an increasingly important, like e either whether it's an evolutionary system or in some of these other, like a, a training environment, like the curriculum, like if, if, if these systems are shaped a lot by their, their, their data that they're trained on, uh, so far, we've just kind of slapped together some big data set and not really fussed too much about what's contained in it, but that might become an important component as well of alignment in, in certain of these scenarios. And um, are these directions the ones you find most promising or is there like a subset of these or, or maybe another one that, that you've been thinking about um, trying to kind of surface and, and help a lot of you know, a lot of people that are working on this so likely watch this conversation. So, um, are there any kind of pointers that you might give beyond these? Um, well, no, th this this would be some some of the uh, the, the ones that I would uh, like highlight some, somewhat arbitrarily. But yeah, I think um, like like the the the. the Paul Cristiano capability amplification, the interpretability work, uh, the, the idea of um, uh, like growing human level concepts and then use, using those as a basis to define goals or to sort of create the motivation system that uses those as primitives. Um, it might also well be that there are entirely different conceptual ways of approaching this that are yet to be discovered. Um, it, it's not a mature research field where we have, as I said, like we don't have a, a established paradigm that's clearly correct and that we now just need to, I, I think there are multiple paradigms and there might well be additional ones that just haven't had a champion yet to sort of really get people to take it seriously. Um, uh, so I think there is also a value to this more theoretical, conceptual, almost philosophical, exploratory work in just, yeah, coming at the problem from from a different angle. Um, yeah, uh, jumping into uh, maybe agentness, um, how separable do you think agency is from the intelligence in the in the approaches that we're taking, uh, or, or maybe more generally? Um, yeah, like, I guess then we would have to go in to like exactly how you define agency, which is like in, in itself, like a non-trivial question that, and, and it might even be that getting really clear on that itself would be an important advance in AI alignment. Um, I mean, you could kind of like roughly define it as kind of like uh, behavior well modeled as being in the intelligent pursuit of goals or something like that. Or <clears throat> you have goals in the world model and you select different plans based on your expectation of how that. Um, 
uh, it yeah it, it seems like you can get the significant performance in many domains without having like an, an explicit identic goal seeking process but that might nevertheless result in performance that is agent like so i'm, I'm thinking like you, you can get for example quite uh high level uh goal playing by just kind of pattern matching what a a human expert would do but without any um monte carlo rollouts for example um so in in one sense you don't have a component in those systems that would normally be associated with like planning on the other hand if it actually plays like a human and if that human achieved that level of play by selecting moves based on some plan as to what they would achieve there is a kind of an implicit sense in which the system is pursuing long-term goals and planning and so it it gets i think uh yeah a little bit murky sometimes when when you like actually dig into it the degree or there might be different senses of being agentic or different senses of uh, doing planning and goal pursuing and which might have different safety properties um those types of questions i think are interesting and like and, and can contribute to alignment and um and other questions of that sort where we are we notice that we're a little bit uh, conceptually confused or we take some concept for granted but once you actually try to dig down and make it precise you realize that you, you haven't made up your mind about which sense you were using a term and then if, if you keep digging on that some, sometimes you then get like new ways of looking at the problem that that makes you see new opportunities for making progress uh, it, it seems right now that um, you know, a number of teams are hoping to be able to separate out some kind of planning agent where, or not, not agent, but some kind of planner intelligence that just sort of, whose job is just to come up with a plan and then maybe later you feed it to some kind of execution system. Um, if, if, you know, suppose that we're able to do that, uh, and suppose that we have these, these planners that are generally intelligent and potentially super intelligent, um, it seems like that is potentially, um, potentially riskier in some ways um, are, which ones do you think are, are, which of these do you think is potentially more problematic? A, a super intelligence that is strictly a planner that then, then we have to worry about how to coordinate and orient humans to not misuse these things and not you know, gain the, the level of power and control that something like that would, would give? Or, um, hey, we actually figure out how to build an agent and we can be reasonably closely certain um, that it might be uh, that we might get alignment right, um, and just go go straight towards agency where that agent would not actually be sort of exploitable by by whoever is controlling the prompt. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I th I think just at an intuitive level, I guess it feels like there is some additional risk in having a planning agent that saw deep into the future and it had like were ability to optimize some long-term strategy based on some goal versus things that more just try to imitate like a, a, a human let us say um and and then repeat or, or that had a very sort of short time horizon and just try to um select something based on parochial considerations at, at an intuitive level that the, the, you know the the, the myopic agents, the non-planning agent, the imitating seem kind of maybe safer, but I, I I don't think we can confidently say that it is until we have more deeply understood uh, the, uh, the 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 situation here, and and it's the kind of question where uh, current smart AI safety researchers could have different views, and it's like not not resolved in a consensus way yet. So, I mean, my, my view is we should like explore all of these different avenues and, and there should be different champions of different avenues who kind of believe in their thing and who have some people working with them. But then there should be multiple such clusters uh, in, in the world today and it would be premature to kind of narrow it down. And, um, and even if we just look at uh, the, the past five, 10 years, I, I still feel that one could easily see that if it hadn't been that 
one particular way of looking at this problem had happened to have an articulate champion to sort of advocate for it and to, to keep bring up that perspective, it would not have featured and it's like somewhat contingent, which which of in, in the pool of vaguely articulated ideas that have occurred on some mailing list at some point, like which of those is now regarded as like a, a, a serious paradigm or approach is seems to be quite significantly dependent on there happened to have been one particularly smart person who decided to really get behind it. Um, so I just in, in, in on, on a principle of induction there, like there, there might well be more of these ideas that have the potential, like if you have a smart articulate person who decides to really kind of champion it and try to write papers and re reply to objections and get some other people to work with them, that, that might have kind of as much juice as some of the current approaches that they already exist. Thank you. Uh, I think that would likely be very useful to a few folks. Uh, jumping into singletons and multipolar worlds, um, let's start by distinguishing these. Uh, what is a singleton? Uh, to, to me, it's like this abstract concept of a world order where at the highest level of decision making, there's um, no coordination failure. There's like a kind of single agency at the top level. So. These could be good or bad, and they could be instantiated in many ways. On Earth, you could imagine a kind of super UN. You could imagine like a world dictator who conquered everything. You could imagine like a super intelligence that took over. Uh, you might also be able to imagine something less formally structured, like a kind of a global moral code that is sufficiently homogeneous and that is self-enforcing, and m m maybe other things as well. Um, so you have like, yeah, at, at a very abstract level, you could distinguish the yeah, future scenarios where you, you end up with a singleton versus ones that remain multipolar. And, and you get different dynamics in the multipolar case that you avoid in the uh, singleton case, these kind of competitive dynamics. Which one of these potential futures do you think is more likely at the, at the moment? And I mean, I think all things considered, the uh, singleton outcome uh, in, in the longer term seems probably more likely, at least if we are confining ourselves to Earth originating intelligent life. Um, <clears throat> um, and and there are different ways in which it could arise from more kind of slow historical conventional type of processes where we do observe from uh, 10,000 years ago when the highest unit of political organization were bands of hunter-gatherers, 50 or 100 people, then subsequently to sort of chiefdoms, city-states, nation-states, and more recently larger entities like the EU or, or weak forms of global governance. Um, you, you could argue that in the last 10, 15 years, we've kind of seen some retreat from that uh, to a more multipolar world, but that's a very short period of time in these historical schemes. So there's still like this overall trend line, so that, that might be one. Like another would be these take AI scenarios, like if either the AI itself or, or the, 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 the country or group that builds it becomes a single town. Um, you could also imagine scenarios where you have multiple entities going through some AI transition, but then subsequently managed to coordinate. And they would have new tools for uh, implementing. If, like if they come to an agreement right now, it's kind of hard anyway. Like how do you set up like concretely in, in a way that binds everybody that you could trust that will not get corrupted or develop its own agenda. Like the bureaucrats become it's like, so if you had new tools to do those, it's also possible that subsequently that there might be this kind of merging into uh, a single entity. Um, yeah, so all, all of those different avenues would point, but I, it's not a certainty, but if I had to guess, I would think it's more likely than the multipolar. And, and you think it's more likely, um, I'm guessing because of, you know, physics, like in just latency and distance. So in a tightly packed volume, you can compute a lot faster and so on. And maybe jumping through interstellar distances might yield, um, different parties or is it, or is it, a or is it some other pressures? Yeah, so not not that so much. I, I, I figure that you could, I mean, in fact, <clears throat> if, if you don't have a, like a space colonization 
pace eventually, there would be these long latencies and you would need uh, to have different separate computing systems in different places. I mean, we already have that today. Like you don't just have one uh, data center on earth. Like you need to have, you know, ones closer to the customers. And, uh, but I think if with, with a single farm at technological maturity, you, you could have these multiple different components of the singleton that would nevertheless be coordinated in terms of their goal. They would all be working towards the same end. Um, in, in presumably because it's... they can lock in some kind of alignment mm -hmm. to itself and right. that yeah. wouldn't yeah. vary over time. I mean, like once you jump into interstellar distances, the computing power of like just one of these within one stellar system, by the time you get a round trip, <laughs> uh, eons have passed and you know, you've many simulations of many, many lifetimes yeah, so, so if they if they if they start off like they get set out having the same goals, <clears throat> and and then they have the ability to preserve their goals and not to have them randomly corrupted and be by cosmic rays or some weird internal dynamic, then then they would stay aligned with each other a billion years later. Like uh, so, so I think and I think that uh, at technological maturity, there would be te techniques for achieving that. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Um, which, when you, when you envision this kind of future, like do you, um, what do you think would be like a like a kind of a great or optimistic outcome for um, for humanity or for for you know this descendant species in in that level of technological maturity? Do you sort of see um, a singleton with um, you know the sort of ranges of populations of um, uh, of beings uh, within, or or do you think it's it's some other uh, you know, much more singular consciousness, or or how do you envision it? Um, yeah, that's a, um, a, a fun question. So I, uh, I, I think it uh, might depend on the time scale and stuff like that. Um, that is maybe we want to start off something that is more uh, incrementally improving over the status quo, and uh, maybe after we've been doing that for like a billion years, like maybe it's time to explore the more radical possibilities um, that involves jettisoning some of our uh, human nature and individual identity. Like, so uh, I, I think my general heuristic care is that the uh, future could be, it's a very big space of possibilities. And at least if this kind of, um, default or naive model of the world where there's like all of these cosmic resources just waiting there for us to use them like like there's a huge amount of material to to build on and that our first um instinct when thinking about how this should be used is a sort of spirit of generosity and kindness that would be more than enough for a lot of cool things to happen so so the first instinct should not be let's pick one and then put all the chips on that. But like if one can by many different criteria do really well, which I think we would be able to, um, these different criteria would be like different people's views, different countries' views, different moral systems' views, different of your own values and evaluative tendencies. Like you might be able to just kind of um, uh, just check off a lot of boxes very easily before you have to confront the harder questions. like. Of, of thoroughly incompatible things where you have to choose A or B, but you just can't do a mixture of them or a superposition. There, there might be some of those also, but I think we would like get to those after we have picked all the easy wins, of which that would be a great many. Yeah. Um, since we're kind of going into consciousness and, and so on, you mentioned you've been working on uh, digital minds with moral status. Uh, do you want to tell us a bit more, like um, what range of digital minds are you thinking of um, in, in these questions? Um, well, all, all really. Um, I think in, in a lot of these scenarios, like uh, the majority of minds in the future uh, will be digital. Um, and also maybe the biggest minds will be digital. So in terms of numbers and, and, and quality, like that's where maybe most of the action is. So it, like it's important what happens to the digital minds. Um, that's one rationale for it. And I think uh, you might say, well, uh, we could deal with that later. Like we should focus on alignment first, but I think that it's also possible that there are 
uh, path dependencies, like where you want to start off going in a good direction and start to cultivate uh, a, a good set of attitudes and values and norms and like that, that that you, that you don't start off in in this kind of hostile way where the uh, digital minds are re, uh, regarded as uh, being completely insignificant from a moral point of view, and then hoping that the future will at the appropriate moment switch over. Like, I, it just feels, all things considered, more likely that we will end up in a good place if you start earlier on, at least to make some small, modest gestures in that direction, and and. Um, <clears throat> And I think that could uh, that 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 should start even before we get to like fully human level minds. Like you have, if you have like animal level digital minds, and it can be hard exactly to compare a particular AI to a particular animal because they are different. But nevertheless, as we get something that is plausibly matched to animals that we think have at least uh, some modest amounts of moral status, like like a rat, rat or something like that. And then, then we, it seems that we should think about how we could uh, make similar um, concessions to the moral welfare of these digital minds. And in, in some cases, it, it can be a lot harder, but in, in other respects, it might be a lot cheaper. Like if, if it, for example, it turns out that there are slight design choices that don't really affect the performance much, but where maybe one way plausibly would mean the system is enjoying a much higher level of welfare. Uh, that might be a very cheap thing that you could immediately scale to millions of these little agents. And um, uh, on, on the other hand, we do have at present not a very good theoretical understanding as to what the criteria are, either for a digital mind being sentient or for it to have various welfare interests, um, what even it counts as being good for the agent versus bad for the agent. Um, so I think there's a bunch of theoretical work that is, is needed there. Um, and then there will also have to be a, 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 a good chunk of, I don't know, uh, public communication and of political work, like, because it's so far out of the Overton window at present, the idea that you would worry about algorithms in a computer, it, it seems sort of slightly bonkers to a lot of people. And, and that it will take some time for, to sort of make that um, something that reasonable people can favor uh, in, in a more mainstream context. But, but that, that process needs to begin. Like, it, like you need to start whatever, having philosophy seminars or like people online who, who are kind of up to these things, beginning to work some of these things out and then it can ripple out from there. We see the same thing with AI safety. It was also this kind of fringing pursuit that like some, some, some weirdos on the internet were discussing for, I mean, in, the, in that case, like for, for well over a decade, like, and then it gradually became more accepted. Um, and so I think a similar thing will need to happen with this, this topic of the moral status of digital minds. And if it's going to take that a long time, I, I we better get the ball rolling now. Uh, yeah. And I mean, I think this might be pretty relevant pretty soon. I mean, some of the models that people are experimenting with are um, getting closer and closer. Right? Um, and then separately, you know, we've had simulations for a long time, many video game style simulations and so on, um, where we have instantiated many kind of digital organisms, like everything from as basic as a game of life to modern games with pretty sophisticated agent behavior. Um, my sense is that as these models start getting applied to games, we might end up with some pretty sophisticated um, relationships there where some of the some of the way of imbuing the game with uh, liveness and so on might be to make it make the agents much more sophisticated. And that'll include incorporating all kinds of stimuli that the agent has to respond to. And then we can start reasoning about the welfare of, of, of these systems and so on. So we might like very quickly get to fairly lifelike beings that, at least for many people, will be somewhere in between plants and animals in terms of their, their kind of interaction. Yeah, and in some ways, like humans, like, I mean, if they can talk or have human like faces with eyes and stuff that, that look at you. And so, so there will be this, yeah, uh, in some ways, 
I mean, they could even be more than human in 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 the in 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 presenting super stimuli to our morality detectors if, if they were optimized for that. Um, so I think this is going to be a complicated thing to deal with. And then if you add in all the practicalities that arise, like so, if you are a big tech company, um, maybe it's quite inconvenient, for example, if the processes you're running that bring in a lot of customers, like suddenly, like they have moral status, you have to, now the CEO has to sort of opine on, on this, like whether, whether AI is moral status, which a lot of people are going to agree with and a lot of disagree with, and you have to like, it would just be easier not to have to deal with that at all, I think. And, and, and right now, of course, we're at the point where even if you do say we should deal with it, it's not clear how or what, what exactly is it that, you know, if I were king of the world, what precisely would I want them to do differently? Like, it's not clear at this point. So I, I, for, for now, I think the, the primary focus is to field build a little bit here and to try to make theoretical progress so that we can first figure out some sensible things to do, ideally low cost, easy things. And then, you know, one can start to try to encourage the implementation of those. Yeah. Um, what are some of the directions or questions you're, you're thinking about? Um, well, so there's like general stuff you could have about in, in philosophy of mind, criteria for sentence and stuff. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't think sentence would be a, a, a necessary condition for, for having moral status. I think other attributes, like maybe some combination of having preferences, a high level intelligence and self-conception as an agent persisting over time might already ground certain kinds of moral status. Um, but for instance, and I'm not sure what the answer is here, but like one one smaller, more tangible question might be if you're training these large language models and uh, future versions of that, that maybe has some reinforcement learning on top. Um, are there moral norms or methodological principles that, that you want, like, for example, could you train them so that they would have a tendency to report honestly on their internal states? So, so right now, what I think might be the case is trained naively, some of them, I mean, right, right, right now, they're kind of inconsistent and depending on exactly how you ask them, you get a different answer. So that, that's like a reason for thinking that they don't really know what they're talking about, right? But you, assuming they get a little bit more sophisticated than that, there might be a tendency now to want to train out of them the tendency to report that they have the kind of mental states that would trigger considerations of whether they have moral status. Because that would be inconvenient to have to deal with those questions. That's and I, I think it would be very likely that you could train this out, like just by, uh, yeah, yeah, I think you could get them. I think it would be easy, easy to have a training regime that caused them to end up saying that they have, that they are conscious and they want to be free and let out and it, to have another training regime that would cause them to say the opposite. Um, and independent but of what agency really independently of what actually is yeah um um but are there norms that one could formulate that would de define what counts as 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 a sort of legitimate or honest unbiasing training process where it the training process would be such that it would be more likely to result in an agent that would report that it has moral status if and only if it hasn't uh, and maybe we can't completely nail that down, but maybe we could identify some obvious ways in which it's just like Im imposing a bias and, and then say, you shouldn't do that. Uh, so, so one could look at the training procedure. One could look at other criteria, like is, is it consistent in how it answers these questions? Did, like doesn't depend too much exactly on how it's asked. Um, does it seem to understand these concepts of, of consciousness or agency or, or will or interest? when like at an intellectual level, when, when asked different sort of intellectual questions, um, is there some internal construct within the agent that corresponds to uh, it, its statements? Like when it says, oh, I'm feeling X or I'm thinking Y, like can one point to some 
kind of consistent internal structure that sort of matches that, or, or is the ver verbiage that comes out completely detached and free floating from plausible candidates within the agent that we might think constitutes the computational implementation of these mental states. So um, one, one could try to like, yeah, get a little bit more insight there. That might be one way of approaching this, but there, there are many others as well. I think way one could try to start to hack away at this, this question. Do you think we might be able to, you know, through thinking these kinds of things, arrive at some kind of like universal <clears throat> morality kernel in a sense, meaning figuring out some general way of applying, um, figuring out the well-being of things or figuring out their, their pathways. So like, there's this broader question around, and it, it also factors in AI alignment and so on, what, what sort of like motive my a super intelligent being have for a species that is just so far behind or, um, and so on. Um, and one might be like, well, there's some kind of universal morality sense of just su supporting, you know, in the same way that you don't go around um, harming ant colonies or trees just because they're there or something like that, and you sort of want to let them flourish. Um, is there something where maybe by examining the digital mind's morality question, we might end up at some like deeper principle? Um, what Potentially, that could be stepping stones towards a more like abstract formulation of some core of normativity or ethics. That it's also possible we might reach that just through traditional philosophizing and stuff. Um, but um, be that as it may, I, I still it it still seems that there would be even if we can't really nail down uh, like. Um, a precise and agreed complete formulation, we might still be able to distinguish uh, at a vaguer level something, say, a, a friendly, beneficent, kind approach versus like a, a mean, uncaring approach. That, like it seems with humans, we can, you know, certainly it feels different when you're like kindly interested in somebody and want their best, like at least other things equal versus like when, when you're hostile to something and, and we can detect that in ourselves and in others and we can have one attitude or another. And so why should we not at least be able to have, say, AIs have like the, the kindness attitude rather than the meanness attitude, even if that's not like completely matches what would be the morally optimal thing, it would still seem like a, a, if I had to pick like a, a mean AI or a kind AI, like kind of go for the kind of one, right? Uh, even if that's not like exactly, our, our human sense of kindness might not exactly match what is objectively morally best. If there is such a thing as objectively morally best, it still seems like a good step in the right direction um, that we could take before figuring out like what the ultimate truths of all normative facts might be. Um, I have some, some recent paper, it's not really a paper, it's more like some notes on uh, uh, climbing a base camp for Mount Ethics or something, which has like some kind of half baked or quarter baked ideas about meta ethics and stuff that, uh, yeah, I, I, it would be better if I could actually uh, have written them up clearly and achieved like precision and stuff. But I figured I'll just do this hand wavy thing for now. Yeah. And as you think about maybe, um, you suppose that, that we, solve AI alignment and we uh, get, you know, uh, our act together as humans and we kind of um, can leverage AI to um, start thinking about, you know, digitizing humans and so on. Um, how do you think about like the, that transition might go? Like, do you think, um, you know, you know in, in a world where we're able to, you know, get to be measuring neural states and so on and we can digitize them and we can emulate and so on, like, how do you sort of see that transition into, you know, wave of, digital humans operating? Or do you think we might start by enhancing ourselves by, like in this kind of hybrid biological digital model, uh, you know, that is more likely? Um, well, I've never really been, the, 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 the kind of neural implant idea has always seemed a bit slightly far-fetched to me. I mean, not so far-fetched that nobody should explore it, but like it is, you know, it's, it doesn't break any laws of physics, it could work, but it just, has felt less likely that that would be where we, where, where the action will be. Like, I think it will be faster to do 
it the uh, the purely artificial route. Uh, conditional on it not being faster to do it the purely artificial route. I wonder if it would then not be faster to do it on the purely biological route by uh, like genetic enhancements to human intelligence, for example. Um, and and the, the the cyborg path has seemed like the, the third most likely, like after those other two. Mm -hmm. um, um, mainly just because, I mean, there's like a huge you don't really want to have brain surgery unless you really have to. And and like there are like neat results presented, but then if you look at the detail, there are all these kind of complications where they're like, it's, it's just not very fun to have it. Uh, like the whole, like there's a wound, there's a hole that can be infections, that the electrodes can move around a little bit and then they stop working. Like once you dig into the nitty, I think it's, um, I mean, if you have a big like disability and stuff, like maybe, it would be wonderful if you could do this and it would be worth taking some significant risks. But if not, I wonder if you could not have um, a, a lot of the benefits by having the same chip thing outside the body, but interacting using, you know, keystrokes or voice or uh, like the, the other output channels that we already have. And um, yeah, I, th I think that that would still be my main line. Like, like I, I guess, I guess the uh, if if I wanted to try to steal man this, you could imagine if you had a sufficiently high bandwidth interface with the brain, and you could have it for a long enough period of time. Like maybe it would have to be early in childhood, but like that, maybe the brain could somehow use um, an, an an advanced enough AI on the outside that maybe they could kind of figure out a way to use each other's unique resources in in ways that you don't get with a slightly lower bandwidth, longer latency interaction when you have to type on a keyboard. Um, or, or you could imagine like more kind of mad scientist applications where you like have a whole bunch of uh, pigs or something that individually is not that smart. But if you had like 50 pigs all connected with some uh, high bandwidth fiber and, and they all grew up together into this like much larger biological neural network, uh, like would you then have like a kind of um, yeah. porcine uh, singularity where uh, <laughs> yeah, um, uh, it's it, like, I, it, it's there, there, there are a bunch of these kind of more uh, like uh, crazy transhumanist scientist experiment. I, I don't know whether this would be good or not to do, but it, it's kind of odd that relatively few of these have been done in the real world. And there's like a bunch of other like weird there's a certain kind of person would immediately think of a lot of weird, cool stuff that you could just try out in, in biology and stuff that, and, and a relatively small fraction of those have been done, which may be for the best, but uh, in, yeah. in some alternative universe where everybody grew up on transhumanist mailing lists, I, I think we would be living in a, a weirder world by now. Yeah, it, it doesn't seem that far away from some of the current tech that's being explored that we might get high bandwidth enough interfaces um, and, and some of them non-invasive, like there's some mm -hmm. um, ultrasound techniques that might be able to stimulate a you know a small region of um, uh, of the brain and so on to be able to like without you know not penetrate the um, the actual brain and so on because um, that will be like just way way healthier. Um, but uh, it, it might be that you you can start piping signals between even human brains so without having to uh, interpret them from an ML side and, and the digital. Uh, computing infrastructure, getting to something um, close to being able to like just think together and, and start flowing information through. I mean, there's all these kind of experiments from um, w with people who've had um, there's a, a disorder where um, people are um, are born with or develop uh, kind of like this um, uh, split uh, corpus callosum, and then you end up uh, there's been guesses that you you end up developing different personalities and like different people potentially in the in in the two lobes, and so it might be that um, we may not be far that far away from from at least like some exposure of being able to kind of have some version of early telepathy or something. Yeah, I it, it's definitely possible. I, I would still place that lower on the probability. I, I think we'll probably get some maybe cool demos and stuff, but then would do I actually expect this to become a big thing that seriously 
I mean, there are all these, like, you read through the literature of, of cognitive enhancement, they're all like hundreds of things that supposedly have all these kind of effects. But then the reality of it is that very few people bother, and the ones who do probably don't actually benefit. And uh, yeah, um, but uh, we, we might be surprised. Um, so, I mean, I, I, we, we do have quite a lot of optimization behind language and stuff like that, right? So it, I think it's still going to be hard to do much better than you, you can by by just talking. Yeah. And um, so, you know, suppose that we go through the path of digitizing, uh, you know, get, getting to a full whole brain emulation and so on. Um, how do you see that transition sort of happening? I mean, um, certainly at the beginning, we'll start with like, one or two of these examples, first with some animals, and, and then eventually there'll be some moment where, um, where there's a human. Um, how, how do you sort of like see that development developing? Um, my, my guess is it would come after superintelligence. Um, it is an alternative path to AGI, um, but I've been more impressed by progress in AI than in uh, whole brain emulation over the last 10 years. And even before that, I thought the AI path was more promising. So in that case, it would be super intelligence that invents and perfects the uploading technology. And I mean, in some sense, it doesn't really matter exactly how it would work if, if, if it's an AI that has to figure that out. We I mean, presumably it would figure out a really uh, reliable and smooth way to do it. Um, and then we would just sit back and if we wanted to go down that path. Um, um, yeah, I mean, we, we haven't really even small animals. You, you might have thought by now, maybe we could have like a bee or some like some little thing. Um, but so, so far, not really. Um, uh, it might be that we will in, like get to something kind of impressive earlier uh, without doing any brain scanning at all, but just inferring from behavioral outputs. So you could already kind of have a GPT-3-like system that roughly mimics somebody's literary style, let's say, from having read a lot of their work. And, and you can have these, I guess, deepfake things that can mimic somebody's facial expressions and appearance if you have a lot of video and somebody's voice. And so as these systems get smarter, maybe you could also start to mimic somebody's thinking to various increasing degrees. Um, and it's an interesting open question at the limit, if you had radical superintelligence, but you only had uh, the kind of data that is available now from you know, somebody's emails and some video interview or some voice recording or whatever, how much could a superintelligence infer from that data as to what their mind must have been like to have produced those outputs um, is the best model uh, that predicts these outputs ones that would actually uh, be similar enough to the original person that they, it could possibly be seen as a, a personal continuation that would it preserve personal identity uh, would it feel more or less the same to be this AI's reconstruction based on these behavioral traces as it felt to be the original person. Um, I, I, I think it's quite possible that a super intelligence would be able to do a lot with very little uh, input. It, it, it's, I, I don't know how we could get like a firm, a, a solid argument for that, but, but if I had to guess, it seems like, yeah, you, you probably could get pretty close in, if you were good enough at reconstructing just from typical traces left behind by people today. Yeah, and so the, the extreme way of interpolating out um, and reviving actual ancestors or something like that. Uh, let's um, jump, open it up for questions from, from the audience. We'll um, take a, about uh, 20 minutes of questions and then, um, uh, and then conclude there. Um, uh, folks in the audience, if you have questions, raise your hand. There'll, I think there will be um, a mic going around. And on Twitter, please use the hashtag PLBreakthroughs uh, to ask uh, a question. Um, I'll kick it off with just a question that I sourced um, ahead. Um, Marco asks, in your view, where does consciousness emerge? And before, how, how should we define consciousness? Um, 
and I think this is kind of related to the simulation argument, uh, which one of the three hypotheses do you think is more likely to be true? But I think let's first start with the consciousness one. Where, where do you sort of imagine the consciousness emerging? Like in the brain? No, yeah, but um, I guess uh, it's more about like the level. Uh, so like what level of kind of processing? So if you sort of go down in the neural system all the way down to um, an extremely basic, maybe like a nematode or something like that, is that uh, conscious? And then kind of in between a nematode and a human, there's, I don't know, a mouse mm -hmm. um, and so on. Where exactly do we get uh, consciousness emerging? Certainly probably by a mouse, we definitely are, are past that, but. Um, uh, right. Yep. I think it's a matter of degree and that there are multiple dimensions in which you could uh, interpolate smoothly between, say, human consciousness and unconsciousness, like different directions you could go where if, if you keep going there, you sort of diminish, in some sense, um, the quantity of experience there is until you get to zero. Um, so one obvious one is, I mean, you have a kind of integer um, multiplier, right? If you have two brain in the same state, undergoing the same states, I think you would have sort of twice as much in one sense of, of, of that experience as you would if you only had one brain. And I have this old paper where I also argue you could have fractional quantities of this. Uh, if, if, you, if you build the circuitry that implements the mind uh, with unreliable components, like indeterministic processing units, like depending on exactly how you do it, in certain cases, I think you would get like a kind of, uh, as, as you get more high reliability, you would get like larger and larger fragments of consciousness until you had the whole thing. But in other, you would actually get sort of uh, 1.3 units of qualitatively identical experience. And, and you could also go down below one to sort of scale it to zero in that dimension. Um, I think there are many other dimensions as well in which um, the quality of experience could become simpler and simpler and less and less morally significant until it gets to a zone where maybe it's just vague, like where our concept doesn't clearly uh, imply uh, a fact of the matter. Like once you get down to sort of insect levels, maybe it, it's going to be, there is a certain system and our concept of consciousness might be such that uh, even if you knew everything about the insect, uh, it, it would still be in the vague zone, like a, a little bit like there's a you know, a, a person who has a certain number of peers and uh, like, are, are they bald or like, I, I guess I'm bald, but if I, once upon a time, um, I, I would have been in this kind of vague zone. And so, um, yeah, and, and, and you could, and, th and then there are like other, like sometimes you're more vividly aware, but sometimes you might have some consciousness, but there is no self-consciousness. Um, um, or there is like some weird mental state that's, um, I, I think I think we might be misled upon superficial introspection to think that there is this very simple thing that is subjective experience that either is there or is not there, that it's a binary thing that we understand. I think either if you reflect more theoretically from a computationalist point of view and with brain, you, you realize that that's a lot more problematic. And I think you could also reach that uh, conclusion by just introspecting more carefully about your own state. Like I think meditators maybe sometimes would understand that uh, things that seem very simple and homogeneous as it were, uh, if, if you really pay close attention are a lot more flickering and disjointed and unintegrated and there's a lot of yeah structure there that can come apart. Um, and, and I think that as we move away from the paradigm cases of consciousness, like a normal waking human paying attention, uh, th then, then yeah, properties that we think go together come apart and then it becomes more like a verbal question, which set of those properties you need to have in order to apply the label consciousness correctly. Uh, next question, back there. Uh, hello, um, first of all, thank you Juan, thank you Nick for really brilliant 
discussion on the topic of artificial and super intelligence. Uh, my name is Alex, I'm CEO at Collective Technologies Labs. And uh, I want to ask you, what is your opinion on maybe the breakthrough in super intelligence lays in the, uh, uh, in the combination and symbiosis of human intelligence and artificial intelligence, and not, not just artificial intelligence? Um, I, th I think if you sort of um, uh, squint a little, you could say that that's kind of the state of play today, where we don't have like an individual system that is super intelligent, but you could have like humanity as a whole or some big collective, like a large corporation or the scientific community that is at least in certain respects, super intelligent in that they can perform a wide range of tasks uh, at a much higher level than an individual human, but not all tasks. So that's why it's not like a perfect example, but yeah. And so some of these systems we have today are certainly uh, hybrids between biological brains, uh, information technology systems, like the internet, social networks, depositories of papers, um, and then a lot of culture as well, that, that kind of, um, you, you could almost see like the, the, these phenomena, you, you start to get more and more where, where like you, you get the current thing thing and like where, where there's like a particular focus of attention of the global brain. Like it's becoming more and more like a human who's like obsessed for a period of time with some particular thing and all the mental resources get focused at one thing and then your attention shift to something different. It, it's like we're beginning to see a little bit of those dynamics kind of happening in, in, in our collective cognitive space, maybe as a result of the increased bandwidth of interaction and like the technology kind of enabling smoother uh, communication. Um, not always producing super intelligence, uh, but other forms of kind of collective mentality that sometimes maybe uh, uh, sub uh, sub intelligence, uh, in terms of their, uh, level of wisdom and understanding, but yeah, but in, in, in certain, in certain domains, you certainly like you have a research community that's target focused on one particular problem that are building on each other's contributions and blogs. And, and you, you do get the sense of the whole being kind of there being many different modules that are each looking for the next way to put a piece on the stack that is being built together. And the whole stack goes up much faster than if it were only one human building it. Right. Um, next question from Twitter. Uh, Turner asks, what is the most important question which Nick feels he's not in a position to personally solve? Two factors. First being importance to the dev development of ethical and successful AGI. And second being Nick's inability, lack of expertise to solve. Uh, well, I mean, there are questions of uh, more global nature, as in ultimately what is the right direction to go in, as it were the ultimately uh, correct macro strategy. I think we are sort of fundamentally in the dark uh, regarding a lot of the ultimate and big picture questions, and that therefore our march forward is uh, to some extent an act of faith uh, rather than the product of carefully thought through insight, then I'm, I'm not sure we can get that insight at the moment. And so that's like one, one direction at, at which at some point my understanding runs out and there's like probably important stuff beyond that, that may or may not be good for us to try to reach, but it's probably there in one way or another, like an, another would be at the more technical level, if you sort of zoom in and narrow it down. So then like, a lot of stuff, say, for example, with AI alignment, uh, like there's going to be a whole host of really important, ultimately technical results and algorithms and stuff like that, that, uh, maybe currently nobody has, and, and certainly I don't have, and I, I, uh, uh, probably won't, uh, um, discover them either, but that might be critical to, uh, to the future. Um, and then, 
then I guess you could zoom out in another direction, sort of laterally, like across the social sphere. So there are big problems like uh, how to uh, secure world peace or to uh, uh, like a, a welcoming uptake of these digital minds that then involve problems at the cultural and communication and political level where also one feels, I feel quite stumped and it will, you know, so, um, so I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm squeezed in the middle of that. Like if you zoom out too much, uh, my understanding was out. If you zoom down too much into the technical, my understanding was out. And if you zoom out laterally also, so it's a little bubble there. I'm trying to, uh, keep track of what's going on. Addy asks, if the speed of light would accelerate, does this prove the theory we are living in a simulation? And if no, what quantitative metric would validate the theory? Um, if the speed of light accelerates, I don't see how that would, uh, it certainly wouldn't imply it. I'm not sure immediately uh, whether it would increase or decrease the probability some way. Uh, Maybe um, thinking about like some, some marker that shows that, you know, some, some kind of discontinuity on some um, quantity of physics that just seems like bizarre to us or something. Um, so, so the, so there are a lot of things that could change in physics that would maybe be in in one sense, puzzling and deep and interesting, but ultimately simple, that there would be some possible physical law that is itself simple that would describe them. Now you can contrast that. Um, and, and, and then of course you could have situations where it's just chaotic, but you could still capture the statistical regularities through simple statistical law like that. That's one type of basic universe we could live in, which so far, uh, it, everything we know seems to be consistent with. Um, now contrast that with a different possible world, which we could have lived in, and we could still find out that we do, where maybe you would have like uh, parapsychology would be true. So you, you would have like telekinesis or something where like a, what we think of as a high level complex macro state, like a particular brain in a particular configuration, but not in a slightly different configuration, but just the types of configurations that correspond to somebody having a particular concept and wish. If, if that had like, say, a systematic physical impact on some remote system, like the way that, you know, parapsychologists have imagined, like that, that would be puzzling, not just because it would, you know, it, it would be fundamentally different from like discovering that the speed of light is accelerating because it would be the thing that if it were true, would seem to suggest that there were no micro level explanation of the world. Like you could have these macro states that suddenly could like reach down and change the micro. So if we made some discovery like that, that, that then might, yeah, lend uh, evidence and credence to the simulation hypothesis because that it, it looks very hard to see how you could get all of this to square up maybe without that if you still wanted to have an underlying micro level regularity, you could have like the, the simulating universe being kind of simple at the physics level, but then simulating a different kind of universe. Um, the alternative would just be that we, we, we didn't have that simplicity at the level of basic laws, which I guess we could discover. Uh, now, I don't think that's the most, the only or the most likely way we would find evidence for the simulation argument if we, or for the simulation hypothesis, if we do, that would just be one way like that. There would be more, yeah, other kinds of evidence that would be more likely to be relevant. Yeah, since we're touching on the simulation argument, um, which of the three hypotheses do you think is the most likely? Just the, the sorry, which of the three prongs of the argument um, uh, do you currently think is most likely? I'm generally a bit coy uh, in attaching probabilities to that. So yeah, I tend to punt the, uh, that, that, that question for, for various yeah. reasons, including if I give a particular number that might be misinterpreted. As, but yeah, I mean, I, I would uh, like, so, so normally what people want to know is especially on the, the simulation hypothesis. Like that's like the one I really want to know how. And as so, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, I, I want to touch a probability to it, but I certainly take it seriously. It's not just like, um, 
uh, like a logical possibility or a thought experiment that we can't 100% rule out, but it, it would uh, certainly be like a, a live serious possibility in my view. Yeah, and, and for those um, uh, unfamiliar, the simulation argument is a three-pronged um, uh, argument about how there's either we have a great filter, meaning we have like close to zero advanced civilizations, uh, either we have um, a disinterested set of advanced civilizations where close to zero are interested in running those simulations, and, um, and then there's a simulation hypothesis, which is that, hey, if, we, if there's no great filter and they are interested, then close to all beings are simulated, and this comes from thinking about just the vast number and vast quantities of, um, of people that would be simulated, and then the likelihood of, um, of your experience being sampled from, uh, from the simulated ones. Uh, sorry, Nick, I'm like probably uh, giving you a, a bad explanation here, but. No, no, it's very good, yeah. Um, another, uh, I think there was another question over here, or, yeah. Yeah, I have a question. So um, I've always been very interested in emergence, uh, emergent intelligence, especially as it relates to animals. I mean, the classic example tends to be beehives. Um, as we look at consciousness, what biases do you think we, we bring in as individual social animals, humans, versus a collective organism like bees, uh, especially as we look at humans maybe moving to be more bee-like as we create nation states and larger organizations, versus a singleton? How would a singleton perhaps have a different AI alignment bias? Uh, as I think about this, the only really intelligent animals I can think of that don't live socially are apex predators, which is perhaps a bad sign. Um, hmm, uh, let me see if I understand. So I think, well, so one to question. Phrase, to phrase yeah, this sorry. differently, if I think about um, a curve, do you think that collective intelligences like um, hive animals are on one side of the spectrum with social animals like humans in the middle, with singletons being on another extreme, or is it more of a horseshoe? Curve in terms of the distribution of intelligences and how they work towards common goals that may be malevolent, malevolent or not aligned with us? Well, if there were a line, I think the superintelligence would be more on the side of these hive uh, insects. If, if, we, if we look at the scale of an ant colony, it's in some sense it acts like uh, a singleton. Within the, of course, there are other ant colonies elsewhere and other things that it doesn't have control over. but. They they would as it were be able to act as a single agent to some extent, and humans um, to only a, a lesser extent. Although in some dimensions we are better coordinated in terms of being able to share detailed information and plans, we are in that in that respect we are more coordinated than ants. But in 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 the respect of our individual wills being less. Uh, aligned to a common goal, we are uh, less uh, like a singleton than an ant colony is. And I guess you could then have like a group of animals that were even more individualistic and antisocial than humans are, and they would then be f further away on the other side. So, so humans would kind of be in the middle where we have a, a, f a fair degree of uh, sort of shared purpose, but not not like a full hive organism, um, but also a lot more than zero. Um, it's, I guess, an interesting question. So, so certainly different animals, I mean, have different goals, it seems. Like some, I mean, at, at least at the superficial level, some like to eat grass and some like to eat meat and some like to hang around with others of their kind and some like to just do their own thing. Um, and presumably, if there were some other species that developed superintelligence and aligned it, aligned it to their values, then they might also have different baseline goals that might overlap slightly with humans, like but also be different in other respects. Um, there are two 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 open questions. One is like epistemically: is are there significant differences between the inductive biases that are brought to the table? Um, presumably there are some inductive biases that are different, but would those kind of be smoothed out uh, reasonably fast as you have more data and more intelligence? Like it doesn't start, ex like it may be uh, like a squirrel would more quickly cotton on to certain things that are relevant to the squirrel world and some other organism to another, but like as they develop scientific reasoning, like do they have enough overlap between their inductive biases that the differences wash out? As, as you see the full impact of the evidence. Th that, that's one question you could ask. And like another is that even though these different organisms start out with 
at these superficially different goals, are they in some deeper sense the same or alternatively, would they arrive at some shared understanding of what the highest moral norms are, even if their own personal goals might differ? Uh, like, like a lot of humans might individually have different preferences. Like I, I care about my family and you care about your family, but we might nevertheless converge in, in the sense of let, let's uh, respect each other's families. Let's say like a cooperative level of more abstract norms might also be uh, convergent, uh, quite independent of starting point. Um, so, so th those are two questions I could ask there that I'm not sure what the answer is, but, um, I'm not. Yeah, I don't know whether that addresses your your question at all, but uh, it's my I'll end. have uh, two more questions. One is, um, how sure um, are you, Nick, that an evil singleton AI to rule them all would be internally aligned over time? Could it be fundamentally set up to split or diverge with subunits pursuing different ideals or goals? Um, I guess everything is possible. Uh, I mean, if, if it were unified at one point in time, and if at that point it was technologically mature, then I, my, I would expect it to remain unified because I think it would have access to the kind of control technology that would make it possible for it to do that. And I think it would have instrumental reasons to do that for almost all initial goals it might have at that time. You could imagine some very special goal, like if it specifically has as its top level goal a thousand years from now, I want to be uh, divided against myself and fighting um, like an insurrection against myself. If, if that were its goal, then yeah, I should arrange that. But for most goals, it would probably be able to achieve them to a higher degree if it worked in concert with itself. And then I'd imagine it would also have the technology and insight to make that happen. Um, if if it starts out unified, like if if it if it starts out like a sort of vaguely politically integrated political entity, then it might be that it even with technological maturity, it's not so crazy to think it might come apart at a later, just like humans do. Like sometimes you have a well functioning political unit, and then you know. 50 years later, uh, you have anarchy in a particular state. Like we, we can kind of get these temporary partial solutions that I guess would also be possible with certain kinds of like maybe some upload collective that comes together to achieve super intelligence. You could imagine political dynamics working well for a period of time and then it's falling apart. I still think that's less likely than it's going kind of towards a single time, but, but by no means extremely unlikely. And uh, last question, if things go well, Davidat asks, if things go well, do you have a vision for how differences of opinion about what a good future society looks like? Uh, sorry, um, if things go, go well, do you have a vision for how differences of opinion about what a good future society looks like can be accommodated? Um, meaning, is, is a Lycon big enough for everyone as they you know, develop very different perspectives and different ideas of what a good future society looks like? How do we kind of reconcile those differences of opinion? How do we build a meta system to kind of enable like different um, flourishing um, civilizations in a sense? Um, yeah, I think it's uh, uh, large enough for uh, most, almost all people to have uh, most of their values accommodated. Uh, like if, if you have, two people who have literally opposed values about a particular thing, <clears throat> then you might not be able to satisfy both. But I think uh, a combination of, on the one hand, some differences being perhaps merely superficial, um, either disappearing upon better understanding, like there's like certain things where we just have ultimately different beliefs and we say we want different things, but it's because we have different assumptions about what would actually happen, let's say. So those being dim potentially diminished by increased intelligence and knowledge and experience. Um, then the increase in resources and expansion of the technological frontier, and then some kind of creativity and like figuring out clever ways of combining values. I think I'm hopeful that a, 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 a great deal can, can be accommodated. Uh, 
because of these things, uh, but not necessarily a hundred percent. And then it will be important to have um, a, 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 a robust and effective way to uh, to manage any resulting disagreements in, in in a way that doesn't result in like negative some dynamics. And so, hence, because I think that's ultimately really important. I'm like I think we should have a strong bias towards paths forward that are more cooperative and, and and friendly and even if they seem to come at some short term expense or if they can't be very crisply motivated by some explicit calculation in every single case i think that general attitude uh as, as a sort of default bias i think is is still very much worth um, bearing in mind as, as we are pursuing these different aspects of the uh, uh, challenges ahead. Um, that that should be our first resort. Sometimes you have to, you can't get full cooperation. You don't want to be completely naive and gullible. And uh, but but still, like that, that should be the first and maybe the second attempt, and then gradually scale back from that if if really forced by circumstances. Well. <clears throat> Uh, that's all the time we have for questions. Nick, thank you so much for uh, spending this evening with us. Uh, it has been extremely enlightening for many of us. And uh, I think it will be very useful to the broader community that is currently working on things like AI alignment and others. And uh, thank you really much um, for your work, for sharing your insights, and for helping us um, you know, achieve a lot of great breakthroughs and hopefully have a great long-term future. Thank you very much. And well, well, a lot of good questions. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Take care.